hiking here. Uh, you know, it's funny. We get more people show up for, for life than we do for a Bible teaching. Oh, my goodness. That's terrible. So, <laughs> gee, Manetti. All right, guys. Listen, um, this I did this message not long ago. And I want to say, says either Brother Ron or Brother Galen one actually commented about this when I did it. Um, and let me get the screen shared. Let me first get some of this stuff out of the way there. By the way, I don't know if you guys, I, I did just a quick news before I came on. Um, and it was funny because Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, um, is is uh let's see we got okay okay so there's some more folks jumping in now there we go i guess what it is i just got maybe i'm in the wrong time zone so but anyway he actually boy that man had some courage I, i'm like his political career is over i'm like my goodness that guy was brave enough to 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 go against Netanyahu and called his whole it called his cabinet of uh and he named them by name Ben Gavir and uh and and Sh what was it? it was um I forget the other guy's name there and he said that they were bigots <laughs> I'm like there goes your funding you must be ready to retire by now or something but um I'm waiting to see when he's going to have to apologize for what he said but, but anyway, listen, tonight, it's a serious night that I want to share with you guys. Um, let me go to screen share so you guys can see here, too. Um, I do feel like we're going to end up probably having a very large group in here before long. And it's just, I know I got to get to the consistency and I got to make sure that I, I put this out properly. And probably what I need to do is do an email list um, so that people could get, I could send you guys an email and let you know, okay, we're doing it tonight. Uh, I've got it set right now for Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, not necessarily every Thursday night, but I would like to get it to where I do do it every Thursday night at eight o'clock and going into some kind of in-depth look on, on, on biblical teaching. And, and I wanted to go deeper on this issue about the veil. And the reason being is because I, I, you know, in studying these, uh, these gospels that are not part of the canon, um, sometimes you get very interesting sayings in there that uh that line up with what our what you know with what the bible says but it gives you maybe that little bit of edge that little bit of difference in there and that's one of the reasons i really got into the veil because there was i i don't know if it's philip or if it was thomas that wrote this but this is the one right here that caught my attention and I'm very cautious about the way I look at any of these because some of these books that are out there, I I I I see why they they're not part of the canon or anything because they're really questionable and and I don't know if I would even uh, could go with it. But then there's others like the Book of Thomas that e even scholars are like, this should have been part of the canon. And by the way, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Every single apostle wrote a book. Every single one of them did. Uh, there are allegedly some of these books out there, but nobody really knows for sure. Was it the actual apostle that wrote it or is it a copy of somebody else what they wrote? Um they're very difficult, and and some of them, as I, uh, you know, because I, you know, part of the Noon Institute being a research institute is researching these documents, and when I look for the parallels uh, in those texts to see how do they line up with what we already have. And I, I, in fact, one time I was doing a very deep study on it in so much that I was taking all the documents that were related to, to New Testament type of teachings, not, now not the 
not getting into the Gnostic side of the ones that are there that are just like make your head spin when you read them, but the ones that are just more grounded in what they would call gospel type related material. And then what I did is I began to overlap it and I would cross reference it and I would, I would, and I, and I literally was making like an index of all the, the similarities, where you would find it, where you cross reference it at. And that's one of the ways that I really discovered a lot of the different writings there that, that exist that I would say would be, you know, more probable that it could really be a canonized document. Uh, there's one uh, on Andrew that they claim that he wrote, but it just, something seems to be missing uh, in this one. It, it's almost as if the priest wrote it later years after or something. It just doesn't follow a flow that seems to be normal. Uh, and then you have this, there's another one called the, the, now this of course is not by the apostles. They call this one Nicodemus uh, and I think Pilate. And, and there again, it's, it's interesting. I mean, granted it is, you know, you can say it's historical, but whether or not really Nicodemus wrote this work or Pilate wrote this work, supposedly Pilate repents later for what he did to Jesus, et cetera. You know, it's all questionable, but there's still the historicity side of this. And that's one of the things, too, that when you research uh, documents like that, you, you want to at least look at the historical value of it. And, and then, of course, see too try to figure out the timeline when it's written in. You know, there's some that they call they're more like Clementine writings or, you know, it's more of the time of the Romans uh, when everything, when Israel's already been ransacked and they're gone back to Rome. And you can tell that it's from that era. It's not literally, you can see that it's not being written in a time when, when um, the apostles were actually here. So even though it might be attributed to an apostle, there's that question, is it really or is it not? And that's what really creates a big challenge in anything that you that you that you read or you're looking at is because you're trying to 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 figure those things out. So it's it's a major undertaking when you're when you're really studying ancient documents. It's not just a matter of reading it. Uh, you know, you want to really know, is that document true? You know, is it really real? And uh, and so those that's that's where the challenge comes in. We don't always know that. Um, anyway, though, this one here, it says the mysteries of truth are revealed through, though in type and an image. The bridal chamber, however, remains hidden. It is the holy in the holy, the veil at the first concealed, how God controlled the creation. But when the veil is rent and things inside are revealed, the house will be left desolate. Um, one second, we got some more people jumping in here, so... Uh, the house will be left desolate or rather uh, will be destroyed. And you know, that's, that's a direct quotation when Jesus, he's, that's what if you'll notice, this is what the, the uh, allegedly now, and again, I, I don't know. Uh, it's alleged that uh, this was written. Uh, and I, I don't think this was Thomas, it may have been Philip, I forget now, but anyway, but he is quoting Jesus's statement that we have written in the New Testament, where Jesus says in Matthew, I think it's in chapter 23, he said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So he's quoting this, this house will be left desolate or rather will be destroyed. Uh, and the whole inferior Godhead will flee from here. Now, but not in the holy of holies, for it will not be able to mix with the unmixed light in the flawless fullness. All right, so really and truly what, what we're looking at that caught my attention is when the veil was rent, as he says, the whole inferior Godhead will flee from here. That it's not talking about the true father or the, you know, what, what, what some would say the Shekinah glory that dwelt in the Holy of Holies, but it was, it's referring to the fact that the Pharisees 
had taken over the temple. And but again, he tells you, even in this writing here, everything's in a type and an image. Well, if we look at, if we go over here and we look at the writings here in the book of Hebrews, for example, we see uh, very similar, the same thing. Let me see, I got everything in the way here. Sorry about that. Um, and let me move this over here out of the way. Okay. So uh, let me see. I think it's nine here. Let's see here. Yes. Okay. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances and divine service in a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, and which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein the, was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot now speak uh, particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always in the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, by the way, the thing is, what the priest did once a year, that, like he said in that one writing we looked at, that's a type and a shadow. And Christ, when he entered in, he entered in as the high priest. He rent the veil. He opened it up, top to the bottom. And if you remember, too, and I'm just going to jump over here to Hebrews 6 real quick. Um, or maybe it's Matthew. Yeah, it's maybe, yeah, maybe Matthew 27. Yeah, Matthew 27. I apologize. Uh, we have, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now, when we look at that, it just seems like this is like, okay, just, you know, the, the veils, you know, the veil gets torn, and now the graves open up, and everybody that was dead, that, you know, they came up. But it's deeper than that. You have to understand what's taking place. Why? Why? What is the symbology? Why is the veil being rent? And what does that have to do with the graves being open? But it's actually connected. It's, there's actually a connection to the two. When the veil is rent, when it was torn from the top to the bottom, the bottom going down, the reason why it had to be torn all the way down is because it opened up Literally, that veil that's rent, we see it, they saw it in a natural. But when Christ died and he gave up the ghost and, and, and his spirit left his body, he literally tore a veil that was not just a physical curtain. He tore a veil that opened up a dimension where Satan was trying to hold captive the captives there, he was holding them in, in a prison house, those souls. And when he did, that's why it goes from the top to the bottom, the bottom showing those that had already died and gone on, they were being now released as a result. See, it's not just that holy of holies that he enters into is literally opening up that dimension. And then we see, and they came out of the graves after his resurrection. Now, notice when they do it, they didn't, you know, you have to understand, too, that's another thing. I think sometimes we get it kind of mixed up a little bit. People think that when Jesus died and everything and he goes down to hell, you know, the thing in one scripture, it says he preached to the lost that were in hell. They repented a lot, not in the long uh, days of Noah when he preached, right? He, you know, because look, the gospel had to go forth everywhere. In fact, I was asked one time uh, by uh, a friend of mine in the intelligence community, and he says, he, he brought this question up to me. He says, you know, it's one thing that had been asked about, uh, asked before to me was, you know, the scripture says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, what does it mean by every creature? Well, 
th this is no joke. I had, when I and I thought about doing this on a Patreon video one time because it comes to me if, because of that very question that time was that um, when I was a young guy, I was in my twenties. And uh, I ended up, I was, I was stationed at a place in the literally, I'm talking about so deep in a forest, it wasn't funny. Why they put me there to babysit this machine that was there is beyond me, but they did, they had me there. And, and here I was, I'm a young believer, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I got to thinking about that scripture about preach to every creature. And, you know, the only thing around me out there was raccoons, possums, bears, and coyotes and everything else. But I thought, okay, they all need to hear the gospel. So I just started preaching to all them too. You know, I just, I stood up on the back of the truck and was as loud as I could. I preached the gospel to them. But in reality, it's what it's really talking about is the creature is like the Nephilim, these fallen angels, these children of the fallen angels. That's the every creature. Because Jesus went and preached to those that repented not in the long suffering days of Noah. That's ones that would not repent. And they're not necessarily fully human. So, but they're still part of that human side in there because of their mothers. And and, and that's just my thought. I, I could be wrong on that. Um, but that's my thought on that. But anyway, so coming back to this here. You know, the when the graves were open, they come up when he comes up. So they got to hear whatever he said as well. And we know that they appeared unto many and and uh, in the city, there's what it, what it does go on to say. Um, uh, you know, after, you know, after after they came up and stuff. But now the thing is, though, is the veil there it opened up it opened up this 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 gateway so that they could come out but it does more than just that it also is what made the way to bring about the restoration of what was lost in the garden of eden you know the whole redemption story is so deep and so rich and so few people really know what it's all about. They don't, you know, even this this whole veil and, you know, as as that writer that wrote that document there, and I don't know if I can actually pull it back up or not now because the way I got my screen, but yeah, here we go right here. He calls it a bridal chamber. He said, the mystery of truth are revealed through and type and image. The bridal chamber, however, remains hidden. It is the holy in the holy. And what that really is, and let me take you back. Let's see, let me minimize this back again. Let's, let's jump over to Genesis for a minute. Because the, the, this whole, the, the story of redemption is where this all lies at. Um, when God first created Adam and he formed the man, we have here, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. That life is plural. It's right there. The chaim. Chet yod yod mim. All right. Ve'ipag ve'pa'av nishmat chaim. All right, he breathes in his nostrils the breath of life. Now, but he's only breathing into one guy, Adam, right there. Ha Adam. And, but Adam, when he breathes in there, he himself, that clay figure that was made from the dust of the ground, he becomes a lanefesh for his soul. In other words, literally what it means, lanefesh, that word right there, is chaya. It's a singular but it's a feminine singular as well. Now, don't want to get all confusing in how that what, what that works. But in other words, why would it be a feminine singular with him being a masculine guy? The reason being is because he's a, a bride of Christ. You know, he's not a he's not a, a, a in this case here we represent the feminine aspect of that. But if you'll notice, though, the reason why God, though, he did, see, here it's singular, though, just chet yod. 
the hay makes it feminine, okay? But over here, it's actually in the masculine plural, all right? And, the, and why is it in the masculine plural there? Because it's Christ himself. It's his own life that was being breathed into Adam, and he was doing it in a plural form. Why? Because he knew that there was more than one person in that body. Eve was still in there. That's why when I talk about redemption being such a deep story, I mean, you have to, like, for example, go back to everything is types and shadows as it is. I'm bad about jumping around, so forgive me for this. But if you look at, like, for example, when you look at, um, uh, when we go and we look at the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, Jesus is born of a virgin, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason because of the fall itself. That's why there had to be a virgin birth. It, birth. it had to be someone that was not defiled. You Okay, when I say that, I'm going to make it simple because I don't want to make it complicated for you. But you can read between the lines. If you happen to be not here live with us and you want to read between the lines, read between the lines on this one here, right? But let's just take, for example, the Nephilim. How did the Nephilim get here? They got here because these women were tricked into thinking that that was their husband. Now, we don't have that in our canon. We just have that the, the, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them themselves wives. Now, the sons of God has nothing to do with Adam's children. So anybody that goes to tell you that, oh, it's Adam's kids and everything, they went and they, they slept with these... Uh, Worldly women out here, and they corrupted they are Cain's daughters and corrupted the race, and that's what caused this fall, and God got angry. No, that's totally false. Do you really think that Cain is going to his his daughters are going to produce giants with, say, Seth's kids? No way. It's not not even possible. Um, and I want to tell you something too that I saw. Uh, I happened to, to turn on Netflix uh, just recently, and when I did, they had this, this um, I think they called it Troll, uh, was, was the name of this movie, and uh, I, all that's it's just like, I guess it's something new they just added or something like that, you see these little previews. And the reason I bring this up is because it reminds me of what I found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And like I said, I'm bad about jumping around, so forgive me. I'm going to come back to the redemption here in a second. But they show this guy. He's standing there, the guy and a girl or something like that. And it looks like a mountain rock in behind him. Then all of a sudden, the eyeball opens up on it, right? And it's some kind of weird-looking giant creature that looks like a mountain. And then suddenly he stands up and, you know, but he looked like part of the mountain when he's just laying there on the ground. Do you realize that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the children of the fallen angels said that when their bodies fell on the earth and they died, they looked like mountains laying on the ground. And when I saw that little clip of that little, I don't know, maybe 30 second type of thing that they had playing on there, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what it must have been like when the, of course, when the giants died. But that couldn't have come from if if the sons of God were Seth's kids. It couldn't have come from them, and it certainly couldn't come from Cain's daughters. They're not giants. We don't have any record that they're giants. But these fallen angels that come down, they saw that these women were beautiful. I think that's in Genesis chapter 6. And they wanted them but they were, they were married and these women wouldn't go with them. When you read that in some of these writings that are, that are, that, that are out there, we find out, and I think if I'm not mistaken, it's in a book called the book of John. That's, that's not part of our canon. And that's, and believe me, that's a very difficult book to read. I don't necessarily recommend it. I don't know what to think of the entire content of it, but on that one issue, I found interesting because it said that the women they refused those fallen angels when they first come, but said they transformed themselves to appear as if they were their husbands, and that's where the fall took place. Now, that actually seemed more plausible.
But what I'm saying when I say read between the lines here, in other words, it was basically an adultery that caused the fall. So there had to be a woman that was not defiled. Now, does it make sense? This is why redemption is so important. Even John the Baptist, he was a true type. He was a type of the restoration of the Spirit of God that was breathed into Adam. John was a type of that restoration. Because why? He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was a type of Eve still inside of Adam. You see, God is in, he's in this whole process of restoration. And this is what so many people don't see. They don't realize that there is a restoration process that's going on or that started back then. And when John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, that's because when Eve was still in Adam, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Never do you see any place after this where God ever has to breathe into her knows the breath of life. Because he'd already done it here. It's literally a plural right there. And the fact that it is masculine plural, it shows that the father did it himself. Or in this case, I believe it, we would say Jesus actually breathed into his nostrils that breath of life. And we see that too, because if you go back to Matthew, and let's say we go to, to uh, I guess it'd be chapter 28. Let me pull this back up we get to the next chapter. Oh, it didn't work that way. I'll go to 28. And, uh, okay. I'm trying to find the one where he says he breathed on them and he said, receive ye the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, or the Holy Ghost, and I don't know. Let me pull it like this here. We'll just put breathed on them. John 20 and 22 is where it's at. All right, let's pull it up right here. We'll try to make this bigger. I know I got a plus sign in here somewhere. There we go. And when he, when he had said this, all right, let's back up verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Again, part of the restoration, part of how the, how God, restores everything back you see what when the fall took place and the funny thing is i have taught this for years i mean years and you gosh probably more than 15 years now i've been teaching about that adam and eve lost the holy spirit they were god breathed into their, their nostrils they both had the holy spirit when Eve came out, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've always said they both lost it because of the fall itself. That's what caused the fall. That's why when you look in Genesis, uh, we have back over here. And by the way, this is all dealing with the veil because the veil is taking you back inside. Think about it like this here. Uh, let me, let me before I say it, I want to pull this up in Hebrew so I can show it to you so to make more sense. Let's see, I think it's right here. Let's see, which hope we have in is the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enter into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us, even Jesus made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. No, it's not that one. All these little bars from that gets in the way. Let's see. 
Okay, the high priest goes into there. Let's see, the Holy Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure of the time when present and which offered both gifts and sacrifice that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and drivers, washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer and sprinkle of the unclean, sanctify and purify of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, and for he is, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of the of his means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament that which are called might receive the promise to eternal inheritance for where a testament is there must also necess necessity be the death of the testator still not the exact one i'm looking for but it's still important to put all that in there all right let's see uh um consecrated for us to the veil Okay, yeah, this, this is the one I was looking for right here, verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. This is the reason why the Roman soldier, when he pierced his side, he literally ripped his side open with that, with that spear. And by the way, that speaks of two different, well, probably more than two, but two that I know of, one, it shows that it, like Adam, Adam's side was opened up and Eve was taken from him. Christ's side was opened up, or in this case here, he is the living tabernacle himself. He is the holy of holies. And when his side was opened up, the veil was torn. And out comes his spirit in order that it might come back upon us to redeem us back to him. This is, this is what this is all about. This is what this whole thing about going in behind the veil is. Because the veil of the natural temple, when that was split open, which by the way, you know, th this was the interesting thing, right? Right. They should, the, the, the Jewish people, the, you know, we know that if, the, if they saw the Holy of Holies, they would die. If you weren't the high priest, you didn't have the blood, you would die. That was, every, everybody always knew that. That was the big thing. If you went in behind the veil uh, into the Holy of Holies and you weren't consecrated for that purpose, boom, you were dead. That's why they even had a rope tied around the priest's ankle just in case he went in there unconsecrated. They drug him out. They weren't about to go in there with him. They drug him out. They didn't want. They knew he's gonna. He's dead. When that veil was rent from the top to the bottom, and the holy of holies came into view, they every one should have died. But they didn't. Why? It's because the blood sacrifice of Christ Himself was the only thing that pardoned them at that very moment. Can you imagine what it must have been like in that day? Can you imagine what it must have been like to have been present there? Being literally present the day that that veil was rent? I mean, it's no doubt scary enough. The earth is quaking the the sun stopped shining and everything, and suddenly the veil of the temple, of the natural temple, is just torn in half. The Holy of Holies is there, and I'm sure some people couldn't help it. They just, they see it, but, but they're not dead. And they don't realize that the very man that's sitting there on that cross right there is the reason why they're not dead. That's the only reason they're not dead. Is because the one on the cross. 
And, but the thing is, the symbology of this, going into the, see, we now are to accompany our high priest back into the veil. That's why when you read here in Genesis, let me let me get down to where it's at. Um, let's see. Yeah, right here. We, this is chapter two. Okay, and the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That has confounded me for years until I realized it was a prophecy. And oddly enough, we we know that, you know, God says, he, you know, the man doesn't need to be alone. I'm going to make a helpmate for him. But the thing is, is in reality, when Eve was in Adam and they were one, truly one, that was the true type of Christ and his bride. Now, it's not still, even when we look at Christ and the bride, us being one with him, it's not like we're going to be hidden in some kind of body just floating around like blood cells in a body. No. But what, even though there is that separation brought and she's brought on the outside. That's also when death set in. Now, granted, they partook of the tree uh, of, of good and evil. That's where the death technically set in. But there was, there was not a oneness. And so eventually death sets in. And oddly enough, in some of those writings, you actually find they say, if, if the woman ever enters back into her husband, and they are showing you that it's, it's the bride of Christ entering back into Christ, then death will cease to exist. So imagine that. You literally could have death not existing. And, and when we are truly in Jesus Christ, death cannot exist. You can't no more die if you wanted to. You have already conquered death, hell, and the grave. The mere fact that when that veil was rent, like I said, it, lit, it didn't, just run, didn't just tear the physical veil. It tore a hole into hell itself where Satan had held some souls there. And those souls came forth from that prison house. That's how powerful it is for the veil to be rent, to be torn. And so when his side was pierced, you know, it's just like that woman at the well, right? Remember when Jesus is talking to her and he says, go bring me a drink. And she says, oh, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We have no dealings with one another. He says, he says, you know, if you knew who was talking to, you'd ask me for a drink and, and I'd give you water. You don't even have to come here to get the water. She goes, sir, the well's deep. And, you know, da, 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 you know, gets in, she gets into this theological argument. You know, you say that, you know, we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem and our fathers worship on this mountain. Jesus says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have one. She thought, okay, this is a trick question, right? I don't have a husband. He says, you told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. Whoa. Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. He gave her a sign to look for. And that sign was fulfilled when that Roman soldier pierced his side. And forthwith came forth what? Water and blood. Why? Why did it separate from his body? Because he is the living water of life. 
everything, if you really begin to examine everything that happened on the day of the crucifixion, even down to the part when he points to John and he says, or he says to his mother, uh, yeah, he points to John and he, he, he says, be, and, you know, Mary, his mother is standing there and he says, behold, your mother. And he says to Mary, Behold, your son. A lot of people thought he's talking about himself. If you really understand redemption, he's talking about John. Why? The whole story of redemption is... I mean, it's just mind-blowing. Everything that happened, that's why when I look at all these types and shadows, everything that happened when Jesus was here had to happen to fix what happened in Genesis. You read Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, all kinds of problems went on. Right down to the birth of the children. Let's, let's look at that real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll take a quick look at that just to kind of make, make sense of that, right? That, you know, we get the fall, right? Uh, God curses the serpent. He's going to go on his belly. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, they don't translate this correctly in, he, in English. They shall bruise your head. It doesn't say nothing about they. The word who is the singular word for he. It is a personal pronoun. Who, Yashufacha Rosh, he will bruise your head. Now, then he says, but here's the interesting part. And to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply thy pain and thy travail. That's not translated correctly either. Harabe and the great one, Araba, lying in wait, he will cause you, singular, just her, great pain and you, great sorrow. Why? Well, he tells you why. You're going to birth sons. Tell a di, tell a di banin. Doesn't say children. He said you're going to birth sons. And that great one that was lying in wait. In other words, he's lying there. He's an ambusher. It was a serpent. And the serpent is called the great one. Why was he called the great one? Because he was over all the cattle of the beast of the field. He was far more superior. He even spoke whatever language they spoke. Yeah, and he would cause her all these problems. And she would birth sons. And then he says there, and your desire shall be to your husband. That's because of the fall. So whatever this great one that was lying in wait did causes her to birth sons and those sons, prophetically, are going to cause her great sorrow and pain. Why? Because one's going to kill the other. And it's her kids. It's her sons. She loves them. You know, whether Cain evil or not for what he did, which we know he was, but still, it was one of her sons. But then he goes on to say, your desire shall be to your husband. The shutecha literally means you're gonna you're gonna turn to your husband. Because why? She lost the Holy Spirit, and he lost the Holy Spirit. And it says, Vehu, Yamashal Becha, and he's gonna rule over you. Why? He doesn't have the Holy Spirit no more. The Chaim is now left, departed. And you got to remember, how do you, how, you know, Steve, how could you say that that, that really departs? Oh, well, it's easy. You forget. I'm going to show you something. I've never showed nobody this before, but I'm going to show you something. All right. 
right? When he breathed in the nostrils of Adam, right there, Mishmat breathes, okay? Chaim, he breathes that breath of life into his nose. All right, here we go right here. Verse nine, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of what? Life. Now you don't, by the way, you don't need Hebrew to know this. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of what? Life. L-I-F-E, right? And there was what in the midst of the garden? The tree of what? Life. So you don't need Hebrew to really know this. There it is. Plain as day, right? The And right here it is. The eights and the tree. The only difference is here you got the definite article hey, which means the life. Ha-chayim, which is the same thing that is breathed into his nostrils. So the fruit of the tree of life is life itself. And that very true tree, fruit from that tree was breathed into his nostrils so that both of them would have the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we know that Jesus Christ is that tree of life. We know that because over in Matthew 28, he's breathing on them just like in the beginning so they all receive the Holy Spirit. Now, after the fall, though, that's what I was going to show you here, right? See, after the fall, now the way of the tree of life is now guarded. What do you know? Let me find it. Here it is, right there, verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed on the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of Chaim. So he drives them out. This is why redemption was absolutely 100% necessary was because of the tree of life. So that's what I wanted you to be able to see. So when you go in behind the veil, we're literally going into Christ. We are reuniting with Jesus Christ as some of these writers wrote in there. We are actually reuniting with Jesus Christ in the bridal chamber. We are becoming truly one with him. So when the veil is rent, the way is made for us to enter in to Christ. And he is that tree of life. And that one place where the true restoration of that life is, is when we are in him. Just like when Eve was inside of Adam and his own life was breathed into that body so that they both could become one. That's why I tell you, Genesis chapter 2, down there at verse 24, is a prophecy. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That was a prophecy of Jesus Christ. He left his glory above. He left the presence of his father. He had an earthly mother. Remember, he's born of a virgin. It's not Joseph. So he left his father, and then he leaves his mother. So what? He could cleave unto his wife and become one flesh with you again to restore back what was lost in the very beginning so that that life that is in him can be in you, so that you can become one with the tree of life. That's what that's all about. Guys, I hope this blesses you in some way, and uh, I'm I'm going to have to probably stop for, for now. Um, I know that uh, I've got my 
daughter texting me. She's not been feeling very well here lately, her. And uh, actually, everybody seems to be sick right now. So, but anyway, um, I just want to tell you, I love all of you. Appreciate you coming in here tonight. And, uh, and you know, and like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do this every week. So just pray for me that we can pull that off. You know, if we can't, I'll try to make sure I announce it early enough on that we can't make it. But, uh, but I know I've got to run. I've, I've got to put away all these critters here. I got running around out here and then uh, and go deal with this little girl of mine that's asking daddy to get her mustard. <laughs> so anyway, thank y'all for being in tonight. God bless y'all. And uh, next Sunday night, or not Sunday, Thursday night, we'll try to join together to do this again and go deeper into something else as well. God bless y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome.